So, with this animism stuff, I would love to just keep talking about it more and more, and I'm super excited about going to Africa and getting to encounter and experience. But I wanna transition for the rest of today into polytheism. And remember, polytheism means many gods. Poly, many, theism god. When we look in archeology, span <clears throat> that sort of thing, what we notice is our earliest depictions have all these different properties going on or forces in nature. And it could be life, it could be forest, it could be thunder, lightning, rain, mountains, lakes, rivers. And the early people was very easy to give these different spirits or personas or personality. And you could say that's like an anthropomorphism or a personification, but it was more than that. They were really trying to understand these forces in nature and these powerful things that were happening. If you've ever been in like the Great Plains states, Wyoming, Montana, the Dakotas, and during the summer, these thunderhead come, comes up. And for the Native Americans, the shaman would actually go out onto a bluff and he would commune with them and beg them not to hurt the tribe because they were going to be carrying all this powerful electrical charges and currents. I mean, they wanted the rain, but they didn't want to get struck. So here's a shaman standing on these hilltops communing with these thunder beings, and they considered them like their brothers. And if you've ever experienced them, it's not like the rain we get here in Southern California where it's just a big gray sky that comes in. These are like physical entities in these thunderheads, and they're just full of power. You can just feel it. I mean, the, just the electricity in the air. And so this idea of these things are actually beings that have personality, purpose, a function, a role in life. And it's easy to understand, like I said, with animals, even like trees, other living things that we would consider living in the West. But remember, for the animist, everything's living, except for dead things. So even things we would consider inanimate or non-organic, that doesn't apply for this worldview. But it's exhausting. If I was an animist, believing I had to supplicate all of these spirits in this room, it, it would be exhausting having to deal with the spirit of the carpet, of the podium, of the chair, of the expo marker, of the whiteboard. What the polytheists are thinking is, what if we elevate some of these spirits into like divine status, like demigods or, or little gods? They're, they're not the creator of heaven and earth, but these are powerful spirits and they kind of have this different category. And so say we have a goddess of education. If I'm in right relationship with the goddess of education, she's gonna take care of the spirit of the chairs, of the tables, of the expo markers, of the podiums, of the whiteboards, as long as I'm in right relationship with her. Same thing, instead of having, I'm, I wanna sail across the Mediterranean, instead of dealing with every shark and stingray and eel and dolphin, I can just pray to Poseidon. I, it's like a one-stop shop. I go to the top dog of that realm, and if I'm in right relationship with that being, he's going to keep all his sub-minions in check and under control. And so you would get different deities assigned different responsibilities. Like Zeus became the god of the weather, of storms, of that power, right? But he also became the king or chief of the gods. We get gods of the forest, right? I brought one today, Pan, or, or satyrs. We have Atlas, he was one of the titans that kept the earth and the sky separate so they wouldn't collide into each other. <clears throat> we have Neptune or Poseidon. We have Vulcan, right, the god of fire or of volcanoes, of, of mountains. And we even use those words incorporated into English today like vulcanize, right, and that, that heat and fire. And so what starts off as animism, and this is, I'm taking this from cultural anthropology, where they're trying to do a description. They're not trying to say this is how it should be. They're simply saying this is how it is or has been in the world. And these early civilizations are animistic. But animism 
begins to, you could even say evolve, into polytheism. But then out of polytheism, we get those three modern worldviews, both naturalism, materialism. Remember, the Greeks, those early monistic materialists, came out of a polytheistic culture. Weird. Theism, monotheism, Abraham came out of a polytheistic culture. They had gods and goddesses for everything, probably human sacrifice, the whole nine yard. And even later when we get to Hinduism, um, Buddhism, Taoism, those came out of polytheistic cultures where they begin to say that these aren't thousands of gods, these are all just different ways of looking at one god. So polytheism over time literally evolves or changes into monotheism. This idea of one god. But even in the Bible, we see a progression. Think about how God is described in Genesis. He's like this primordial, the spirit of God brooded or hovered upon the face of the waters, right? He's presented as like this vital force or spirit, like this creator destroyer sort of God who can create life and he can snatch it away. He can make a beautiful world and he can scour it with a, a flood. You know, he is this, the beginning and the end. And so this sort of God this sort of primal spirit God then kind of turns into a God of law. When we see the Exodus and the Jews taken into the wilderness, right? Where now he's not just this primordial chaotic force of nature God, a pillar of smoke or a pillar of fire, but now he's a God of law and order and justice. And then this is taken into like a shepherd God where we have like the prophets are come in and the people are seen as like sheep, and God is this shepherd, and he sent sub-shepherds to take care of his people. And then this eventually moves to the idea of God as like king. And you see a lot of kingship imagery in the Bible, where we have earthly kings, but that's like a microcosm of the cosmic king, of who God is in heaven. But then we go from a God who is a king to a God who is a man. And if you're coming from a naturalistic, materialistic perspective, this is kind of like how they see religion today. We made up all these different explanations until we matured enough as a human species to realize if there is any God, it's us. Right? Which goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks again, who made the gods in their own image. Right? Not they were made in the image of God, but the Greeks made the gods into their image, a projection of themselves into the heavens. And so whether you take this as Christ, the God-man incarnate, and this is like the progression or evolution of religion, or whether you're a secular humanist that believes, yeah, we had to come up with explanations before we understood how things really worked, but now that we're older and wiser as a species, we realize we're it, and this is all, all there is.